you turn back to Galatians, the second chapter? Now, I'm attempting to bring one message out of each epistle that gives the meaning of the epistle. I cannot, obviously, preach verse by verse through a whole book in one. I could, but y'all would get up late if I did. Um, but uh, I want to just bring one message. I've already looked at um, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and we're going to look at the message of Galatians tonight. Verse 5, chapter 2, the end statement that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. It was in danger of leaving. And he prays that the truth of the gospel might continue, might remain. Now, in some respects, Paul's epistle to the Galatians is unlike any of his other epistles. When he wrote to the Romans, he said to all that be of Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. He said to the church at Corinth, <clears throat> to the church of God which is at Corinth, sanctified in Christ Jesus. He said to the Ephesians, to the saints were at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He said to the Philippians, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. As a matter of fact, if you read those epistles, you would probably think the Philippians may have been his favorite as far as people go. Um, he said to the church at Colossa, to the saints and faithful brethren which are at Colossa. He said to the Thessalonians, to the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he commended every one of these churches. But look in verse 6 of Galatians chapter 1, what he says to this church. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now it's been said that the letter to the Galatians is a, conven is a condensed version of Romans, and I would agree with that. It could be called a condensed version of Romans. However, when Paul wrote to the Romans, he was defining the gospel. And when he wrote to the Galatians, he was writing to some people where it appeared the gospel could be leaving. And the theme of Galatians is the recovery of the gospel. When he said that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, it was in danger of not continuing. Now that is a solemn thought. Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed. Galatians 2, 5, uh, he lets us know that the gospel was in danger of leaving. He said in chapter 3, verse 1, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? He said in Galatians 4, 9, How turn ye again to weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire to be in bondage? He said, I'm afraid of you. That's what he says to these people. I'm afraid of you lest I've bestowed labor upon you in vain. Where is the blessedness you spake of? There was a time when you didn't feel the way you do now. 
He said, I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. He's saying by that, I'm afraid he hadn't been. That's what he's saying to these people. He actually said, I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, you that desire to be under law. Don't you hear what the law says? Stand fast in the liberty that's in Christ Jesus and don't be entangled in the yoke of bondage. You did run well. Who did hinder you? What happened that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion that you have cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And I think of what he said in chapter 5 that Drew just read, if you bite and devour one another. Now that's what law does. It causes people to bite and devour one another. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. And he concludes this epistle with these words. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. Like I'm finished with this. I'm not talking about this anymore. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the uh, scars he had in being beat up for the gospel. And he said, I'm not going to discuss this matter with you anymore. Don't let anybody troubled me. Now you can see why I said that this epistle is very unique from all of the other epistles. All the other epistles, he commends them. Every one of them, even the church of Corinth, he commended them. But there is no word of commendation to the Galatians. <clears throat> and this book can actually be sad, summarized by that fifth verse in chapter 2, where I want the truth of the gospel to continue with you. He was afraid it was going to leave. He was afraid it would be no more. And he desired that the truth of, gospel, of the gospel might continue. Now let's start back up in chapter 1, verse 6. He said, I marvel. I am utterly amazed. I'm dumbfounded by this. Now, I remember one time Brother Mahan made a comment on this, and he said to the people he was preaching to, he said, now, I would not be amazed by anything I heard that any of you did. I hope you, I would hope it wouldn't be happening, but I wouldn't be amazed by it. I wouldn't be amazed by it. I know myself. I know you. I wouldn't be amazed. But here's something I would be amazed by. If any of you left the gospel of grace, and that's what he's saying to these people. I am amazed that you are so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another. There are not two gospels. What you're pursuing is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert would change the gospel of Christ into a different message. And this is what you're going after, he says to this church. You're going after another gospel, a gospel that does not save. Now look what he goes on to say. But though we, and look at the strength of this language, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be that word is damned. Now Paul is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Somebody says that's harsh. No, it's not. If anybody preaches any other gospel than the gospel I preached unto you, let him be accursed. Just in case you didn't hear me in verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you've received, let him be accursed. Now that's strong language, isn't it? This is the warning he's giving this church. Now, 
He says in verse 11, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel was, which was preached of me is not after man. The gospel that I preached was not derived by any human source. I didn't learn it from man. There's other places where he tells us how he was brought up into the third heaven and taught the gospel by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He didn't have Peter or James or John teaching him anything. He was taught directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I certify you, brethren, I assure you this, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that is an apostle. There were 12 apostles, and they were all taught the gospel directly by Christ himself. And he's reminding the Galatians who had changed or were in the process of changing his message and not believing it. He's reminding him the gospel I preached is from the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. Now he talks about his uh, progress in the Jews' religion before God saved him. He says, For you've heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. I was going somewhere. I was somebody in the Jews' religion. But, verse 15, but. Now you want to know what grace is? But. But God stopped me. But God intercepted me. Now, if you're a believer, you have a but. You were going in this direction and happy to do it. Paul said, I thought I was serving the Lord. But I love that scripture in Ephesians 2, 4, and you Hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the flesh, lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even those others, but God. But God. But when it pleased God. When is a man saved? When it pleases God. Best answer. When it pleases God. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. God had his hand on me before time began. He's referring to God's electing mercies. If you're a child of God, do you know he separated you from your mother's womb? His hand's always been on you eternally. When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, the invincible, irresistible grace of God for this purpose to reveal his son. Now, salvation is the re revelation of his son. You find out who he is. It really is that simple. You find out who he is and everything else just falls into place. You begin here who he is. And you'll, you'll believe everything in the Bible. He's the God man. He's the creator. He's the sovereign of the universe. He's the cause. He's the independent one. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. To reveal his son and I love the next words, in me. You know, it won't do me any good for him simply to reveal his son to me because I'll lose that. He must be revealed in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I know this, if I have saving faith, it's Christ in me. 
the hope of glory. Christ in you. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him. There's the subject matter of our preaching. Him. Who he is. What he accomplished. Among the heathen. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, you know what that means? He said, when Christ taught me the gospel, I didn't go up to Jerusalem to check it out with John and Peter and see if I was right. I didn't need to do that at all. I didn't make any consultation with the flesh. God taught me this. And I knew it was true. And if everybody in the world put turned thumbs down on it, that's okay because I know what God has taught me. And I was not looking for the affirmation or the approval of any human being when God taught me the gospel. Remember, he said, I certify you, brethren, the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. It's not derived from any human source. I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither when I went up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia. There's another passage where it says he was there for three years in a desert. That's where he went to seminary, where God was teaching him in a desert, the gospel. Oh, what a teacher the Lord is. And returned again into Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. This is three years later. And I abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. James was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He was the brother of the Lord. And uh, the Lord appeared to him in, after the resurrection. He was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 as to one of the ones that the Lord appeared to, to teach the gospel. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which are in Christ, but they'd heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which he once destroyed. You know, when he first came to Jerusalem, people were afraid of him. Barabbas, not Barabbas, Barnabas said, he's good. I've heard him. He, he's, he's preaching the gospel. But everybody else was scared to death of him. You see, he was a murderer. He was mad against the gospel of Christ. And now that faith which he once labored to destroy, he preached. And they glorified God in me. Then 14 years after, chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now let's see what was going on here. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Hold your finger there in Acts chapter 2. And he's giving us this... Um, autobiographical information. Verse 1, Acts chapter 15, this is what took place. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now these people came from the church at Jerusalem. They didn't come from a false church, but they came with a false message. Except you be circumcised. True salvation is by grace. True salvation is in Christ. But except you be circumcised. After the manner of Moses. You cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas. Had no small dissension and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas. And certain other of them. Should go up to Jerusalem. Under the apostles and elders. About this question. Now that is what Paul is referring to. When they went up to Jerusalem about this issue of these men saying you needed to be circumcised. Now back to Galatians chapter 2. He said, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them, the apostles, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. I wasn't checking it out with them to see if I'm right or possibly wrong. He said, I let him know exactly what I was preaching. But privately to them which were of reputation, that were held in repute, 
that were highly esteemed, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now what he is saying is, is when I came into Jerusalem, I went to them privately to let them know the gospel I preached because I didn't, if they didn't agree with it, I didn't want there to be a public dispute. I just wanted to let them know the gospel I preached. He wasn't, once again, he wasn't looking for affirmation. He wasn't looking for them to approve of what he's saying. This is the gospel that God taught me. Now, verse, he talks about what took place in Acts chapter 15, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. They were saying Titus. Now, Titus was, you're familiar with the book of Titus. He was a young man who preached the gospel, and he grew up a Gentile. He had never been circumcised, and these people were telling him, you need to be circumcised. So what did Paul say to that? But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of, look what he calls these people, false brethren. They call themselves brethren, but they are false brethren. What did they do? Unawares, in private, secretly, brought in, who came in to privately spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now that's what these false brethren wanted to do. They wanted to bring them into bondage. You need to do something. Now understand this. If there's anything you need to do before God can do something for you, you know what that is? Salvation by works. It is bondage. And these false brethren hate liberty. They hate liberty. They can't understand it. They can't understand this thing of being free, owing nothing, being without debt, serving not because you're afraid of what's going to happen or what you're going to lose, but because you love. They could not grasp that. All they could hear in the gospel is, if you preach that, people live like devils. That's what they'll do. They couldn't understand the gospel. So what did Paul say about these people? To whom we gave, gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, if Paul would have submitted, okay, Titus, let's keep them happy. Uh, go ahead and, and go through circumcision, and then maybe they'll listen to you. The truth of the gospel would not have continued. Because he would be saying by that, there's something needed other than Christ. There's something needed other than grace. And this would have been a complete denial of everything he stood for. And he said we wouldn't give, be subject to their desires and wishes. No, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, if he would have submitted to Titus being circumcised. And before I go on, somebody said, well, why did he have Timothy be circumcised? Well, that's a good question. No one was telling Timothy he had to be circumcised. And he knew that those Jews would have a hard time listening to somebody who had never been circumcised. No one was telling Timothy he had to be circumcised. So Paul said, you know what? For the gospel's sake, go ahead and do this. Not to be saved, but here when they said... Um, you need to do this to be saved. I'm not going to do it. We're not going to give subject to this. No, not for an hour. If Paul would have done this, look at Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. That would, that would have been a denial of that. You also need to be circumcised. That's not enough. Uh, by grace of you saved would be wrong. You are complete in him would be in error. Him perfecting forever them that are sanctified would be wrong. The entire gospel would be denied if he let one work in. Now he said we didn't give place to this not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. If we cave in, the truth of the gospel won't continue. Now every local church... I hope this local church lasts well after I'm dead. It might not. Might not. Might blow up tomorrow. I realize that. I mean, we're just, who knows what's going to happen. 
But I, don't you want the truth of the gospel to continue here? That the Lord causes it to continue to forgive so that our children and our children's children, our children's children's children, if the Lord doesn't come back, will hear the gospel. Now look what he says in verse 6. But of those who seem to be somewhat held in esteem is what he's talking about. Whatsoever they were, make it. <coughs> No matter to me, God accepts no man person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference, they added nothing to me. They didn't say, well, here, you need to say this too. You need to add this to the message. No, they were in complete agreement with what I was preaching. Peter, James, John, they didn't add anything to it. They were in complete agreement. In agreement, they added nothing to me, but contrarywise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, or Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, and they into the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor the same which I was forward to do. But, now he talks about another event. And this is key to understanding the epistle of the Galatians. He talks about another event that actually took place. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him the face and this was done publicly now I, I try to put myself in Paul's place coming to Peter the apostle and publicly reprimanding Peter now there better be an awful good reason to do something like that you know Quick to reprimand. I've always been so quick to reprimand. I wish I wasn't like that. It's ugly. It's ugly. Quick to correct people. But here is a time when it was inspired by the Holy Spirit and was utterly necessary. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. What he did was as wrong as it could be. What did he do? For before that, verse 12, for before that certain came from James, that's the church of Jerusalem, of which James was the pastor. Before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. I reckon they were having pork chops. Uh, they were enjoying the Gentile way of doing things. And uh, he was eating with them and fellowshipping with them and they were having a good time. But when they were come, he was intimidated. He was intimidated by these Jewish believers. You know, any time I'm around somebody that you feel intimidated by, I don't like it, do you? Well, Peter was intimidated by these guys. Now, what, one of the things it tells me, they were jerks. Anytime somebody intimidates somebody like that, they just got problems. But they intimidated Peter by their religiosity for before the certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, intimidated by them. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their hypocrisy. That's the word. Now here's what he did. He sat there at the eating with the Gentiles. These guys come from the church at Jerusalem that were Jews. And he felt intimidated. And he thought, they're going to think ill of me. They're going to think poorly of me for eating with the Gentiles. They, they won't agree with this. So all he did was get up and move tables and sit down with the Jews. Now, what was he saying by that? The Gentiles are saved, no doubt. But if you practice these Jewish practices, you're more saved. Now, that's exactly what he was saying. 
And you want that to deny love? Christ is all. That is a complete denial of Christ is all. Somebody said, did it need to be treated so severely where he publicly embarrasses and reprimands Peter over that? Well, he did. And why did he do it? Verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. There's that phrase again. Remember he said, I want the truth of the gospel to remain with you. Here we have that phrase again. When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, and he was. He was eating with the Gentiles. He wasn't, remember when God appeared to him and said, what God has cleansed, call not thou common? And he had understood this. He was the one who said, we believe that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should be saved even as they. He didn't say, uh, they'll be saved like us. The Gentiles will be saved like us Jews. Us Jews, us religious Jews will be saved like the heathen Gentiles. Uh, He understood that. He said that, but now he's going back. He's pulling back. So Paul says, before everybody, this was public, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compel us out of the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. Now what did he get us? He's not saying the Gentiles are sinners and Jews are not, Um, but they thought that. They thought that. And he said, "We, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, law. Don't miss this. If there's anything you need to do before God can do something for you, that's law. That's all it is. If there's something that you must do before God can do anything for you, you got to get this straightened out, you got to get that straightened out, you got to do this, you got to stop doing that, then God can do something for you. That's no different than saying you've got to keep the Ten Commandments perfectly in your flesh before you can be saved. That is law. Now, justification. Don't ever forget, justification means I have never sinned. I stand before God's law without guilt. When the Lord said, I make all things new, he actually gives you a new history. And it's all good. It's all perfect. It's all righteous. There's no skeletons in the closet. There is no sin. That's what justification is. And I'm justified by the faith of Christ. I love the King James because it's the only version that says by the faith of Christ. All the other versions say by faith in Christ. I'm not justified by faith in Christ. I'm justified by the faith of Christ. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, (coughs) even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, We ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ, the minister of sin. And don't forget who he's speaking to. These Jewish believers just couldn't get hold of what I just said about justification. You mean to tell me that you stand before God without sin, even though you sin? Why? Something's wrong with that. That's making Christ the minister of sin. That's what they were accusing him of. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, 
All I do is make myself a transgressor. Now, what was it he destroyed? Any thought of salvation by works. But if I try to raise that back up, raise the law back up, all I do is make myself a transgressor. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, we're going to rack this up looking at these last three verses. For I, through the law, now, don't miss that. Somebody says, the law is useless. No, it's not. I love God's law. It's holy and just and good. I, I remember hearing a preacher say one time, we might as well throw the Ten Commandments in a trash can. And I, I just winced when he said that. It's God's holy law. I, through the law, being fully honored. Christ honored that law. And all its demands were met in my place by what my Redeemer did for me. I, through the law, am dead to the law. It now has nothing to say to me that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Now notice this. He doesn't say it's just as if I were crucified with Christ. He didn't say that at all. He said I am crucified with Christ. Now, what this is a reference to is the believer's union with Christ, being united to him eternally. When he was crucified, I was. In the beloved, I went to the tree. I am crucified with Christ. When he died, I died. Nevertheless, I live. You know why? Because he lives. He said, because I live, you shall live also. Not only did I go with him to the cross and was buried with him in the tomb. Scripture says buried with Christ. When he was raised from the dead, I was raised from the dead too. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. You know, when I say I live, it feels creepy to me. It did to Paul. Not I. Don't misunderstand me. Not I. I'm not talking about anything I have done. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, if God loves everybody and Christ died for everybody, that verse is meaningless, isn't it? Utterly meaningless. This is what only the believer can say, he loved me. That's the hardest thing I have to get a hold of. That's, you know, people talk about things that are hard to understand. This is, this is the most amazing thing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean. He loved me and he gave himself. He gave himself for me. Now I love these final words. I don't frustrate. Now that doesn't mean that God wants to give him grace and Paul was able to frustrate God's purposes. Doesn't mean that at all. I don't make meaningless, render void and null. I don't frustrate the grace of God. You see, if righteousness come by law, if there's anything that I can do, if there's anything that I can do 
that will move God to do something for me, then the death of Christ was utterly vain. Strong language, isn't it? Only in the proclamation that Christ did not die in vain, but that he accomplished everything he intended to do. Only in that proclamation. He completely saved. Nothing else is needed. Circumcision, works, efforts, your decision, your experience, it's not needed. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down right hand of the majesty on high from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool and only by the proclamation of his completed work where nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it does the gospel the truth of the gospel continue may the Lord cause the truth of his gospel to continue in my heart in your heart, in the preaching of the gospel. Let's pray together. Lord, how we thank you for the truth of thy gospel. And Lord, we ask in Christ's name that you would cause the truth of your gospel to be received by us in the love of it and that it might be burned in our hearts, and that we might be enabled in this time, in this day, to preach the truth of the gospel. And Lord, by your grace, may it remain for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen.